you run Vivo. Yes. Vivo is a big, giant, honking music video property. Very exciting. I think exciting. it gets overlooked a lot of times, even in rooms like this, for whatever reason. First of all, just explain to us, give us a sense of scale. How, how big is this thing? Yeah, Vivo, we do about 17 billion videos a month now. And People that is, watch 17 billion music videos. A month. And just to put that in perspective, if you try and put a number around that in terms of content consumption, you know, it's roughly 100,000 years of content consumption in a single month. And so it's available around the world, uh, 200 markets. Um, 80% of the consumption is actually international, 20% is domestic, and of the 17 billion videos that we delivered in uh, January, already 50% is consumed on mobile devices. Um, so it's got tremendous scale. And are, are they watching the videos or are they using it as a jukebox and it just happens to be that there's a video playing but they, they really they want to hear the song? Well, I think it's a combination, but uh, our, our product doesn't play back in, in sort of a, a background play mode. So you have to have the video playing in order to get the audio as well. So we think it's, a, it's really a video platform and video consumption that's driving it. So that's a big honking media company. Um, for whatever reason we can talk about it, you don't generate the same kind of attention, I think, in some of the banking circles as you might, analyst circles as you might, even media circles. Um, one reason is I think a lot of people think of you as an outgrowth of, of YouTube and Google because most of that consumption is happening on YouTube, correct? YouTube is a very large part of our, our distribution. They're a very large partner of it, but... What, you know, what percent of those 17 billion video views are happening at YouTube? We don't, we don't break down the actual percentage. It's a percentage, majority, right? But it's a good chunk. It's a fair bit. Um, and as I said, they're a very important partner, but we have about 24 other distribution partners out there. Plus we have uh, owned and operated properties in 14 countries around the world. Our own iOS, Android, Apple TV, Roku, and a bunch of uh, MVPD integrations. Like we have an integration with uh, uh, Sky in the UK, with Virgin uh, Media, but also with, uh, I think, Dish here in this country. It's important for you to say that you're not just part of YouTube and Google, even though that's the way the world sees you, and with, re with reason. The reason that you guys exist is at one point Google and, and YouTube got together with two of your owners, mm -hmm. Universal Music, Sony Music, and said, right, we're going to create this hub for music videos. Google's going to sort of host it, um, yeah. get it off the ground. Uh, no, that's not how it started, it. actually. I think it started with, with uh, Doug Morris, who said, hey, we need to do something about music video. There's an opportunity Which we're big on here. YouTube. Yeah, and, and so, but Google came to the party with us I think much later, actually. But yeah, Google was one of our distribution players, absolutely. So you're all, you're all intertwined. I think one of the reasons that people don't pay enough attention to you is that there's a, there's a perception, I think with reason, that there isn't as much business happening here as there should be. Right. That, that you guys really aren't a standalone, independent company. You're either an outgrowth well, of Google I, or- I beg was, to differ. Someone was describing to you to me today as a, as a pass through for the, for the record label saying, really the record labels are just using this as a way to extract royalties and no, no one's interested in really building a business here. Well, I, and your job is to convince people otherwise. No, it's not just my job to convince people otherwise. I think the shareholders by bringing in someone like myself have basically made it clear that this is about building an independent long-term you know, business that is about creating value for the shareholders, that is about making sure that we do, you know, we build amazing products for audiences, that we build amazing services for, for artists, for everyone in the, in the in, you know, all of our stakeholders. Um, you know, and we, today we have 300 people uh, in the company. We have offices around the world. And so I think it's, uh, it's probably not a fair assessment to say we're a simple pass-through because you don't need 300 people for that. But, but your owners I mean, seem to have taken different perspectives over time. Prior to hiring you, they were debating selling it. And they'd hired bankers to sell it. Sounds a bit like what happened at Hulu, who tried to sell that thing twice. Yeah. Again, a parallel with Hulu that's owned by two of the big media companies that put that stuff out there, um, complicating it as you've got this relationship with YouTube and Google, which is fractious at, some time, at points. Um, it seems like a really big headache. Why, why take that job on? There have to be easier big media jobs. Well, I, I like to take difficult uh, how, challenges. How, how good a softball was that for you? <laughs> you like to take challenges. No, but no, so look, I took that very serious. So when, when, we, when we sold the, uh, the YoungQ business to Verizon, I took a nice long break and, and really started thinking about what do I want to do next. 
and took a, took a lot of IQ, time. That was your attempt to create TV. That's right. We'll talk about that in a yeah, bit. But yeah. so you, you, you could and have so, given yourself a break because that was a harder thing. And I did take a nice long break, but I looked at a lot of opportunities. And then the Vivo opportunity was presented to me. And at first, I must admit, I was skeptical because I heard all the things that you had heard. You just have to do a bit of research and you go, OK, they try to sell it. Are they serious about this? You know, the YouTube story, there's a lot of question marks. But in doing my own due diligence and getting to meet with uh, all of the, the board members, getting to meet all the, the, the key stakeholders from, from, the, you know, from the, the people that own the business, I got a very strong sense that they want to do something very significant. And so before taking the job, I wrote a long memo to the board and said, here's the strategy. If you guys agree with this strategy, I'm all in. If you don't agree with this strategy, no hard feelings, but I'll continue searching for something that where's, is it. Where's the memo? The memo is locked away somewhere. I can't publish it. No, All right, can you not. Su summarize what you can for us. What's in the memo? So basically, I think, you know, at the end of the day, the numbers that I just shared with you, right? I mean, they are staggering and, and not many people know about it, which is also staggering. And so if you have such a platform with such amazing assets, amazing content, you have amazing products that we think we can go and build. Um, there's a brand opportunity. I mean, 17 billion times a month that Vivo watermark shows up on, on all these different devices. So there's something to be said there. And so in a nutshell, I think what we're going to be doing over the next three to five years is number one, invest very, very heavily in product design and engineering. We just opened up a new San Francisco office, six times the space of what we had before. We're going to double in size. There. I'm going to be the dumb guy here. What, why does it matter if people are going to watch your videos? Mm -hmm. They're watching 17 billion videos a month. Yeah. Majority are happening on YouTube, even though you don't want to say it. Um, they want to see those videos. Uh -huh. They don't care whether it's in a cool browser or a crappy browser. Presumably it loads fast enough. They're watching internationally, so it's, it works okay on their phones. You yeah. said it's on their phones. Why does it matter if it, there's good product or mediocre product? I think it matters a lot. I think that you know, there is the, the, the fantastic platform called YouTube, which I sort of think of as a supermarket. You can get anything you want in there. From, from you know, you, you pick your taste of, of, of product, they have it, all, all video to all uh, mankind. I think there is an opportunity for a specialty store. A specialty store that really focuses on music, a specialty store that does justice to the music, a specialty store that really tries and understands the audience, caters to the audience, offers curation, and offers a much better ex experience than what I would call a lowest common denominator for, for all type of content out there. So is it right that amazing, amazing content from our artists sits right next to you know, a cat video? Does that make sense? Maybe. Yeah, if that's what people want to watch. And again, like if, if uh, this seems like a pitch you would make to your owners or to the artists, we're going to make you this awesome store, it's a specialty mm -hmm. store, we're going to take care of you. But your viewers know how to go onto YouTube or wherever and type in Katy Perry and watch a Katy Perry and video. They and they're very happy. And they will continue to do that, Peter, as we do today. And so YouTube, important platform, just like the 24 other platforms. We think, however, there is a big opportunity and a white space to build something that is better. So you're going to make it better. That's, yeah, that's, so that's, that's product. So that's huh? number one. And that requires you know, quite a bit of uh, new muscle tissue that the organization doesn't have yet. And so engineering, product design, number one. Number two, um, you probably also don't know that Vivo does a lot of original programming already. Um, and I think the original programming that we do is OK, but it doesn't cut through. And so we have a plan in place now. I brought a, an old colleague of mine from the BBC over, the guy who ran uh, Radio 1 for 15 years in the UK, to help us create a new strategy for our content. And we just appointed a new head of the You want to department. make your own originals that you can only see on Vivo? Short form video, right, that you can find on Vivo, and that are real pieces, daily pieces, weekly pieces, cut through pieces, stuff that really like matters. like the Dr. Dre life story that Apple's Storytelling. Make, no, not necessarily that. I think, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, I was on a, 
I was on a flight from San Francisco to New York and I watched the, um, the Amy Winehouse film and it really moved me. It was embarrassed, but I was, I was crying, basically. It really touched me. teary on an airplane. Teary, yeah. And, and, and to me, I called Andy Parfit, the guy, my BBC colleague, and I said, why aren't we commissioning stuff like that? Not that we need to do hundreds of those, but a couple of really big lighthouse commissions that add value um, and, and, and that make a difference to the industry. And so things like that, I think, are very exciting and very interesting. But besides that, I think there's a big opportunity for us and frankly for the industry to, to have more of a, a human curation voice in the mix. Um, and so today, Vivo's original programming doesn't do much of that. It's all just, you know, what you see is the artist. And we don't have any talent on screen. We don't have talent on screen that represents a, a hip hop genre or an EDM genre or uh, you know a country genre. You and mean so, like a VJ? Uh, maybe it's like, an interesting like like MTV. I wouldn't call it a VJ, but I would call it a curator and a tastemaker. Um, so the, so the, is that the full extent of the memo? Is there no, more there's there's more obviously, but I, I want to give you sort of a, a sense the, of the, the direction. Points. The third point is you know even though the Vivo brand is seen. 17 billion times a month by, by audiences around the world. I think if we're really honest and look in the mirror, we say, gosh, we're a watermark. We're a, a watermark on, 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 on a third party player, right? Our own player, third party player. But it's a watermark that's very meaningful. It's a watermark that has values such as official and quality. People search for it and say, ah, that's the official quality version. Most brands would probably give a left arm and a right leg for those sorts of values to be attributed to their brand. We think that's a great start, but we think that the opportunity is there to truly create something that is a youth lifestyle entertainment brand. Because isn't the brand Katy Perry or whoever I'm going to watch this week or today? Maybe, but I hope the brand, you know, maybe that's the brand today. And I don't know if that's true. It depends on, on who you are and what you're into. But my hope is that ultimately, it is a brand that caters to everyone's taste. I mean, we have the largest music video catalog on the planet. Um, pretty much every video is there, bar a few uh, uh, outliers. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a fantastic service. And so we think we have something for everyone, whether you are a tastemaker and you're interested in experimental artist that no one knows yet, or whether you're a mainstreamer and you want a, you know, an established artist. So you want to build a brand? Before, before I jump to my next question, is there any more memo I want to share? You yeah, the last point of the memo. Um, I think that's an important piece of the memo, which is today our business is all about ad supported. It's free. It's, well, it's not free. I could watch any Katy, get Katy Perry in the head. What's up Taylor with Katy Swift. and you? My kids likes Roar a lot. <laughs> um, I, nothing wrong with that. Um, so it's, it's all ad supported, it's all free. I don't pay you guys anything to watch, I pay my attention. Yes, and so we think there's a, that, that one of the important things, and you hear this throughout the industry, that the move towards subscription, a, a more premium product, that's something we're very interested in and very much you know, uh, working towards. What is, that's a subscription service? Or, or does the whole thing go behind a paywall? Do I no, have to I pay think, to watch Katie No, we believe, we believe in a dual revenue stream. We believe in a, a revenue stream that is both ad-supported. We've got a phenomenal sales force who knocked it out of the park in 2015. Absolute biggest year in Vivo history. Uh, and so we want to build on that strength. It's a real strength that we have and it's important. And the second piece would be, you know, a, a pay model. So, but does the pay model mean that there are things there that I can't see for free? I mean, what, what, do you, what am I paying for? I'm paying well, the details of the ex what, what you get for the pay model, I think that's not something I'm here today to But I'm going to continue on. to be able to watch Vivo for free if I want. There will be absolutely free Vivo, yes. It's an important piece of the puzzle, but we think that you know, just having a ad-supported model is not sustainable in the long run, and, but we do believe that an ad-supported plus a pay model makes a ton of sense. It's tough, right? Uh, video, uh, uh, we've been trained for many years to, to get music for free, whether it's Napster illegally, YouTube legally, sure. Spotify this is, legally. This is Getting true. me to pay is hard. This is true for the whole music industry. By the way, there's a, there's a paid music service now already, then YouTube sells it. Sure, but I think, I think for us, you know, audiences will, will have to see what value they get, at what price point, what features, what content. It's that whole product content, you know, feature mix, that, that, and they'll make up their mind whether they think it's worth it or not. 
Uh, when's the paid service coming out? Well, you know, we're, we'll ship it when we're ready. Uh, that's sort of the mantra. But ideally, you know, I'd love to see something in market this year. But again, if we don't feel that we're ready, we're not going to go into market. So I'm having some deja vu because the last time we talked, he said, we're coming out with a paid service this year. Instead, you ended up, this was the Intel TV. Yeah, the service. difference is we didn't have 17 billion videos delivered a month. We didn't, we you weren't had the available. We didn't, and we didn't have anything signed up from a content perspective. And so, so this is a very different story. It's clearly. a doable thing. Absolutely. Okay. So I do want to travel back in time and ask okay. you about the Intel thing because, again, it was very interesting. You came out here and said, and good for you for coming out and saying it. We're launching this thing, I think, exactly three years ago. Yeah. Uh, and instead, by the end of that year, there was a new CEO at Intel uh, who then sold your company to Verizon, which That's ended right. up sort of dismantling it, and maybe it survives in some form. Yeah. So you were very confident. I, I was very skeptical that it was going to work. You said, no, it's absolutely going to work. Here's why. You laid it out. In retrospect, what did you get wrong about launching a web TV service at Intel? I don't think we got anything wrong as such. What, got, what went wrong is change of CEO. And it's that simple. I mean, and, and look, I don't blame a new CEO coming in wanting to take stock of all the projects that are ongoing and basically deciding, hey, I don't believe in the, in the course of action or in the strategy of my predecessor. I'm going to review everything and I'm going to make my own uh, plans, right? And that is perfectly understandable. What I will say is that we built an amazing product that was probably two years ahead of its time. Um, that we, uh, we had the content deals ready to sign. Out of the nine programming groups that I think we needed at the time, seven were ready to go. And this was just a matter of financial commitment to those, uh, to those deals. The product was rolling off the factory lines in China by the thousands. We had tested. You showed me a box oh, with yeah. a remote. It was a very fancy Absolutely. design, logo, Absolutely. your product. We, were ready. we had pop-up stores ready to go in New York, in Chicago, in LA. And then, basically, change of direction. Now, what I will say is this. Even though it's really, really painful when you're going 100 miles an hour and you're trying to build something and deliver on your commitments and someone new comes in and they say, hey, sorry, I don't believe in this. Um, what I will say is that Intel was fantastic in allowing us the time to go find a new home. And I am absolutely delighted that we found that home with Verizon. And so when, when we talked, I think there was already a CEO transition happening and we said something along the lines of, hey, you're going to have a new CEO. Are they on board? He said, absolutely. But he wasn't appointed yet. He wasn't appointed yet. In retrospect, is there a way that you could have managed that relationship better and kept the thing afloat? Or do you think the current CEO of Intel literally just didn't want to do TV full stop? Didn't no, matter? I think this was not his cup of tea. That simple. I mean, um, Everyone has their comfort zones, right? And I think the comfort zone uh, of the current CEO is Silicon, and they are incredible at that. They are a world leader in that. And so, you know, stay, stay to your focus on your knitting, I think they say. And you said you had a bunch of programming deals lined up, ready to go. At the same time that year, there was a lot of skepticism you'd hear expressed from the programmers saying, I don't know if these guys are really ready. They don't seem like they really want to pay. or They're asking for stuff we can't have. Was there a disconnect between you and the people who sell TV programming, or, or were you along? As I said, out of the nine programming groups that I think were essential to deliver what I called, uh, I think we called it uh, smarter bundles or skinny bundles or something along those lines, right? I think we had seven ready to go off the top of my head. With the terms you wanted, yeah, they were absolutely. all happy. Absolutely. It was it. just a matter of making the financial commitment to doing this. So now that you're out of that business and you have some perspective on it, it's three years later. There's Sling TV, which offers a kind of version of the Similar. thing you were talking about doing, more stripped down. Sony theoretically is selling a subscription TV service. Yeah. No one seems to think it actually exists. And that's it, right? We've been hearing yeah. about people coming into this business for years. It hasn't happened. Something's going on. Why, why, why don't people want to sell television over the web, seemingly? Well, I don't know if they don't want to. I think the problem that we see is that you know, programmers to this day want to cling on to a very, very fantastic ride that they have in MVPD land. They want to cling That's on to the traditional pay TV, traditional pay TV uh, structure, exactly that. And in order for a product to make sense for a different audience, over the internet, you know, if, if it's just delivering the exact same thing that you can get from Comcast, DirecTV, and Dish today, and the only thing that's different is, oh, it's delivered over the internet, 
And why bother? It's kind of what you were selling. No, you not at all. You showed it to me and you said, you said it's, you get all the channels. Well, then we didn't do a good sell, and then it, sell it, job And the big difference was there was an automatic DVR so I could watch whatever I wanted. But it no there. one is that still, was the big difference. to this day, no one has still done that. So, right. so the idea that you can get you know, skinnier bundles at better price points with a fantastic UI, easy to use, easy to navigate, but most importantly, with the ability that everything you have is available in the cloud at your fingertips, no one has still implemented that to this day. So why didn't someone go, all right, well, Intel didn't want to do it, but, you know, we'll do it. Why didn't Verizon do it? Why hasn't someone else followed in your footsteps? Don't know. I mean, that's not, you shouldn't ask me. I mean. You're on stage. I figured yeah, I'd try. No, you can, you can always try, but look, I don't know. I, I think, my, okay, I'll try and give you an answer. My view is that the U.S., is such an outlier when it comes to pay television in the world, this is not a normal pay TV market. In other words, this is a market where there's $160 billion slushing around every single year. There is no other market like it where so much money and so, much so many people are paying so much money. For Absolutely. Television. No other market on the planet works this way. None. I think that markets in Europe, markets in Latin America, probably are much more ripe for the picking. And so in hindsight, to go back to your original question, I think it may have been you know, ambitious to go down the path of doing this in the United States, and it would have been probably a lot easier to get something like this off the ground successfully in a market like you know, a UK or in even a Spain or in Italy. Do you think it's happening this year? Do you think it's happening next year? When do you think some version of what you predicted or were trying to sell shows up in mass? I think the world's moved on quite dramatically. I mean, look at, at the success of Netflix, obviously, with its 75 million subscribers at, what, eight, eight bucks a month. Um, and I think, you know, for me, the pay TV, cable, cable networks and broadcasters, they have one last silver bullet, you know. To, Which to, is? Well, they have the current season. And the current season is still not packaged in a way and offered in a way that makes sense. Yet, if that is done in a smart way, for example, you know, would the, I think you call it the TV industrial complex, yeah. would they put all their chips behind a Hulu and give Hulu current season? Like properly, no, no one holds back, current season equals Hulu. I think you got a very interesting proposition that audiences would love. I think we're going to talk about a lot of this uh, throughout the next day and a half. Um, so bring it back to the present. What, yeah. did you, what was the one big takeaway you got from that previous experience? Everyone up on this stage, all these stages, like to talk about how they're crushing it, things are great, everything's awesome. You failed, right? You, you, your CEO kicked you out, sold you off for scraps, mm -hmm. you had to start again. What did you learn from that experience? I don't think I call it a failure to start with. I mean, to, to, to go at 100 miles an hour and be three months away technically from launching this thing, and, and because someone else decides to change their minds, I don't necessarily call that a failure. That's number one. Number two, to sell it at, at, at a price where, where Intel made a good, a, lot, you know, a good amount of money is not a failure. Three, um, to make sure that all the employees that we brought on board and that we hired into that company were safe and had had a, had, had, had a job, had a living, were secure, I don't call that a failure. A failure is when, you're sh when they roll you out into the courtyard, shoot you in the head and bury you and no one knows about it. That, that would be a failure. Let's strike the word failure from my question. What, what did you learn? What are you bringing to this new experience? All right. So I, I think what is the biggest biggest thing. Look, I'll, I'll try and answer it this way. Before I, went to, before I went to Intel, I was at the BBC. And the reason I joined the BBC was because it had, and it still has, some of the world's best content, best storytellers, best editorial minds on the planet. A long history in technology. It was established by an engineer, an amazing brand, and global distribution. And so for me, what's really exciting about the idea of Vivo is, guess what? <laughs> it's got amazing content. It's got a, you know, a beginning of an engineering team that is fantastic. It's got a brand that has real potential and it already has global, uh, uh, global uh, uh, distribution. And so the learnings is, look for those four ingredients, in my mind, and you have a potential recipe to do something very interesting. To try and, you know, to try and do something like that at a company whose DNA 
is fundamentally about making smaller transistors, right? I saw and, you nodding your head when Joanna Cole said the tech companies say they like content, but they don't really like content. Yeah, it's, fundamentally it's, not, it's not the DNA, and that's okay. And so maybe that was overly ambitious to think that, you know, together with a team of people, even an incubator, we w would be able to do it. Now, we pulled it off, but the plug got pulled before we actually got to show any of our goods. I have other questions, but I want to give the audience a chance first. There's a microphone up there. Bring the lights up for a second. Just come on up. Tell us who you are. Dave Smith with MediaSmith. Um, so talk about the FCC deregulating uh, the cable box and, and the ability to put uh, terrestrial TV, cable, uh, OTT, internet, uh, all in this box with, with much better guide services, search services, everything. Do you think that might bring about uh, this uh, programming uh, renaissance and, and new kinds of, uh, of services and, and bundles, uh, taking it, yeah. the power away from the cable services? Do you think that's possible? I think it is possible to some degree. I mean, to me, it all comes down to competition. And the truth is, at least where I live, there's not real competition. There's not real competition for broadband. I can get very fast broadband or very slow broadband, and there's nothing in the middle, and I pay an arm and a leg. Um, in this country, you can get probably one uh, cable MVPD, and the rest is satellite-based MVPDs. And so competition is what drives innovation. Competition is what drives disruption. But you know, all the things you mention, I think, will, will help. But whether it's enough, I don't know. Question here. Hi, Eric. Um, I would like to ask you. Can you just tell us who you are? Oh, yeah. I'm Martin from Streama. I would like to ask you, given your experience with the BBC and everything that you've been doing uh, so far, what do you think is the future of the broadcast uh, radio industry? Where do you think it's going? Is it going to be disrupted? And how? Yeah. Be great to get your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, when I was about the radio business. Didn't <laughs> oh, I mean, about. look, when I was on the board of the BBC, I, I predicted the demise of, of radio, and I was terribly wrong. And so, in fact, it became stronger and stronger, at least in that country, right? And I think what I learned was the following. I learned that in the case of the BBC, per your question, um, they invested heavily in editorial staff. They invested heavily in people who brought the content to life, whether it was music, whether it was documentaries, whatever it was. It was, it was the taste makers, it was people, it was a people business. Anyone can put a radio station up that is a playlist of, of you know, common tracks. That, 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 I think, is a commodity. But having the names that lead people to discover new content, new music, new whatever, I think that will continue to be very, very, uh, uh, very popular and very powerful. Thanks. Question here. Hi, Sean Shapiris from Bounce Exchange. Uh, you spoke about the topic of original content very briefly. I know it's something you guys have been doing for about five years now. But being that you've established yourselves in the music space, you're you know, getting all these video hits every month, it was a natural progression for Netflix, because they do television, because they do movies, to start producing original film content, original TV content. For you guys, have you thought about producing music videos or working with artists to help them produce music videos? Yeah. Is that on the horizon? Oh, or? we do that already quite a bit. So, so one of the big tenets of Vivo is we help new artists break through. Um, we have a program called Vivo Discover, where we literally work with the labels, work with our own, you know, we have our own networks of, of people out there, and we pick a group of artists that no one's ever heard of, um, and, and we really invest in them. And this, you know, this includes people like a, a James Bay, uh, uh, Garrett, another one, Halsey, another one. People that you probably haven't heard of yet, but you will very, very soon. Um, once they graduate from what we call Vivo Discover, we have another program called Vivo Lift, which is all about helping them find their audience, helping them give a much broader audience, taking them on the road, isn't touring Isn't this what with the them. music labels that own you guys are supposed to be doing? No, we do that. And then, and basically, once they graduate from that, we, we expect to see a quite a few of them to go down into the mainstream. And so a lot of the original programming activity, the content that we create, is all about priming the pump and allowing new talent to reach a global audience uh, you know, through the network that we have. Thanks. Is there another question back there? 
building off of um, what you were just talking about. Marcy, speak in the mic. Sorry, I'm short. Um, can you tell us a little bit about who is the demographic? What are they watching? Yes. And how do they skew? Because you've also said it's global as well, so it'd be great to get all that information. So, so the, the majority of our audience is sort of 13 to 24-year-olds, which is frankly not, not really surprising if you think about it. Um, as I said uh, earlier to Peter, already 50% of the consumption takes place on mobile devices, and that's going up dramatically. Um, and again, that's not surprising. The 13 to 24-year-olds, they're glued to their phone. They live with their phone. They sleep with their phone. Right? I mean, it's a 24-7 sort of thing. It's split right down the middle, male, female. I mean, uh, the Vivo network right now, last time I asked uh, our, our research uh, organization, they told me, and this is a couple months old, I think it's like 340 million uniques a month. So it's a very big base of, 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 of an audience. Um, today, you know, pop is, is very important. Obviously, it's the mainstreamers. But as we move forward with our strategy, we want to start addressing more of the tastemakers and more of what we call the seekers. So, you know, other genres like a country, a hip hop, uh, uh, um, et cetera, I'd say. And so, I don't know if that answers your question, but I. Just speaking a little bit more, though, to you said 13 to 24. So, of those millennials, mm. where, or maybe, the 1324, how does it break down? And again, do they have disposable income right. at the higher end? And then just the global question. If it's 50-50 male, female, is it US, rest of the world? How does that go? Uh, US versus rest of the world, I can answer off the top of my head. It's 20% is, is North America, 80% is rest of the world. So of that 17 billion, only 20% is, is generated out of the North American market. So globally, it's a huge, huge uh, opportunity. Now, we did release a bunch of research that goes into much more detail on the questions that, uh, that you, that you so just to, asked. So to so, save time, let's, let's yeah. send, send them, I'd get it at Vivo.com? Uh, no, why don't, you, why don't you come look me up and I'll, get you, I'll let, make sure you get a, a link from our research team. Eric, I have to get you off stage, but I'm going to kill myself if I don't ask this question. Um, you guys are tied to YouTube, in, in both financially and in, in, as a distribution outlet. If you don't want to say that, it's fine. Um, you have a chance to finally, there really is an alternative to, to Google and YouTube finally coming up. Uh, you could go to Facebook in a couple of years when your deal winds down. Is that feasible? Is that something you guys are actively thinking about? Look, we're always looking for great distribution partners. And as I said, YouTube is one of 24, 25 distribution partners. So could there be a 26th? You know, maybe we'll come Facebook back Facebook and YouTube year. don't want to share you, but we'll, we'll talk about that <laughs> offstage. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. All right. Thank Thanks you very again. much.